And we're going to open today to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14. And we're going to camp out there today uh, in that text. Um, And while you're turning there, I want to tell you that one of the things that I love about this church is that we're a very outward-focused church, amen? And we're called to be that. When you look at the Bible, we see Jesus was very outward focused, is very outward focused, reaching out to people, right? We're we're called to be that. We seek people out that need to meet Jesus. We invite people to church. We pray with people out in public, right? If you're here at the evangelism seminar a, a, a number of weeks ago, we went out and we prayed with people in public and we told them the gospel. Amen. We need to do that. We evangelize. We love people. We open the Bible together and we read about our mandate to do all these things. We talk often about Jesus' command to live our lives thinking about others And telling them about Jesus. And um, I think it's because of those things that we see so many people get saved through this ministry regularly. Amen? It's just always exciting to me to see somebody new come to meet Jesus. And I pray that's your heart too. And that's healthy, right? There's a lot of churches across this nation and the world that don't focus on that at all, unfortunately. But that's not Jesus' heart. We need to focus on that. We need to think about these things regularly. We need to practice them constantly. So with that backdrop, would you? I want you to think about today's sermon a little differently. For a few moments, while I want to maintain and we need to maintain that outward focus, for a few moments today as we open the Bible, as we look at this text that I believe wholeheartedly that the Holy Spirit has brought us to today, I want you to just... Think about this text as it relates to you. And I'm going to do the same. I just want you to think about it, how it relates to you. Because I think sometimes we can hear sermons and think, that's a good one for my wife. (laughs) Or that's a good one for my husband. Or, oh man, my son or my daughter needs to hear that one. Or my friend or coworker needs to hear this. Or perhaps you're sitting next to somebody sometimes and you're just like, hey, yeah, you got to hear that. But what about us today? What about us? Today, I believe, is a day for self-reflection. I don't want us thinking about our spouse. I don't want us thinking about our kids. I don't want you thinking about your friend sitting next to you today. I think it's vitally important, particularly today, that each of us in our own hearts evaluate our own lives in the light of what the Holy Spirit has for us today in His Word. And as it often does when I'm preaching, it begins with a question. And the question is, how committed are you to following Jesus and obeying His Word? How committed are you to following Jesus and obeying his word? I'm going to be honest, right out of the gate here today is not a light and fluffy sermon. This is a tough one, but it's a necessary one. How committed are you to following Jesus and obeying his word? I I, I want you to know that this week, and even prior to that, I started writing two other sermons in preparation for this morning. And nothing just seemed right about them. They were good and all, but, and, and they were scriptural. And maybe I'll preach them someday, but they just weren't for today. And I want you to know that your staff here at this church, Pastor Dave, Pastor Brian, and, and I, we, we really dig in for what God has for this body every single week. We don't want to just bring a nice sermon. And we could do that, you know. We don't want to just bring a nice sermon. We want to bring God's heart to His body for that day and that time. Each and every week. 
So we seek him and we pour over the question, God, what do you want me to say today? What in your word does this church need to hear today? What is your Holy Spirit saying? Where is the anointing? We take this so seriously. Finally, after searching many places, the Holy Spirit brought me to a place I didn't really want to go. He brought me here to Luke 14, to this really very difficult text. And frankly, it's one in my flesh that I'd like to avoid, but by the Spirit of God in me, I know that we need it, and I need it. It's a section of Scripture that I've wrestled with time and time again. It may be, and I thought about it this week, it may be the section of Scripture that I've wrestled with the most in my time reading the Bible, and I've read it many times. And it's just not light or fluffy. But it's real. And it's true. And these are the words of Christ Jesus to us that we're going to look at today. So we need to hear them. Amen? Amen? You see, I'm of the opinion that we need more things that are real and true in our day. If you turn on the news or you read it online, our world and our culture is full of lies. And I don't know about you, but I find even hard truth refreshing. When, when we're just lied to constantly, when somebody, like here on Sundays, somebody stands up and says what's true. Isn't that refreshing? It is for me. You see, Jesus is never one to pull punches with us. John 1.14, Pastor Dave brought us there on Patriotic Sunday. John, speaking of Jesus, says this. He says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We saw his glory, the glory as the only son of the Father, full of grace and what? And truth. Jesus told the truth. Why? Because he's full of truth. He isn't a prosperity preacher. Can I get an amen? Amen. He was very honest about what it looks like to follow him. He doesn't pull any punches. His message wasn't the bait and switch advertisement that we see delivered in so many pulpits in America. You see, Jesus is willing to get into the trenches with us, but he is honest that there will be trenches. Friends, why this message and why today? Because I believe a time is coming and it's very much here where we're going to need to draw some lines in the sand. Just this week, the horrible blasphemy of taking that painting of Jesus with his disciples on the night he was betrayed, blasphemed by transgender people a mockery we must draw in a line in the sand when it comes to these things and we're going to get labeled because of it and we need to be willing to Jesus wasn't a prosperity preacher. He isn't a prosperity preacher. He's very honest about what it looks like to follow him. And the time is coming where there's going to be no more hiding in the shadows for Christ's church. A time is coming when greater boldness will be required. And we're going to have to decide whether we're going to stand for what's right or not. Whether we're going to call out things like that or not. Will we stand for Christ or not? As our culture shifts, ever increasing is this this truth that when we stand for Christ, it's going to cost us. And sometimes that cost is going to hurt. It's going to hurt. But 
when it's a choice between our dedication to Jesus or maintaining our relational circle at the cost of compromise, when we're faced with a decision between growing in our intimacy with the Holy Spirit or hanging on to some possession, position, or our own popularity, when that choice is set before us, what direction are we going to go? How committed are you to following Jesus and obeying his word? The Holy Spirit asks us today, is there something or someone that causes you to compromise? And before you answer too quickly, just really take a moment to ponder that in your heart today. I think all too often we answer these sort of questions when they're set before us without really taking the time to meditate on them, to to maybe write down in our notes, maybe I should think about that this week. Do we take the time to reflect on what Jesus is asking for us? It's too often we don't pray and ask, Jesus, is there someone or something that holds me back from following you fully? Is there anything that hinders my discipleship? Is there anyone that prevents me from going all in? I've wrestled a lot with these questions in my life. But here's the place I've come to. It's Jesus before anyone or anything else in my life. It's Jesus first. It's like Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. An old chorus came to my mind as we were, as I was preparing for this morning, and it just has been going through my mind all week. It's, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Come on, nice and loud. No turning back. I'll tell you something, when I stare in the face of Jesus when either I pass from this life or I'm brought to heaven with him, there is no cost that I would not pay to have him look me in the eyes and say, well done. Nothing. No one, no cost will hold me back from that moment. But the question before us today is how do we see that come to pass in our lives? How do we realize a greater depth in discipleship that brings us to that moment? I think we find the answer in our main text today. And I've read these verses, it feels like a thousand times, and there's some verses that I open up to, and I'm like, I just get hit right away. But this one, I feel like, chips away a bit at a time. And at first, these words might sound harsh. But what I've learned here, in much time of reflection on this text, is that Jesus faithfully exemplifies the words of Proverbs 27, 6 here, which say, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. You see, Jesus is our friend. John 15, 15, he says, I I no longer call you servants for a servant does not know what his master does but I've called you friends if you know if you've met Jesus if you've placed your faith in him he is your friend aren't you glad for that and like a good friend he's going to tell you the truth he isn't going to bring the deceitful kisses of an enemy he's not like so many that I've encountered in this life that flatter you He's selfless. He demonstrates true agape love, that self-sacrificing love that comes from God to man. And that sort of love tells the truth. 
And from the beginning of time, God revealed in the Bible this message of the truth. We learn there in Proverbs that a friend tells the truth, and that's what Jesus is going to do here. He's going to be very open and honest about the fact that there is a cost to following him. A lot of times people preach this false gospel that says, follow Jesus and your life is going to get easier. (laughs) Follow Jesus and you'll be rich. And there's nothing wrong with being rich as long as the money doesn't have you. Follow Jesus and everyone will love you. Friends, these are the false gospels of comfort, wealth, and popularity. And I pray today that the actual words of Christ will combat these falsehoods in the hearts of anyone who believes them today, both here and online. You see, Jesus is about to obliterate those idols here in this text. How committed are you to following Jesus in his word. At the beginning of Luke 14, Jesus, I'm just going to kind of give you a 30,000 foot view of the beginning verses of this chapter. Jesus has a, is a guest for dinner at one of the leaders of the Pharisees' house. And during their conversation, they, they talk about topics like pride and honor, excuses and humility. And there's a lot here in this chapter. We don't have time to go over all of it today, but I want to encourage you to study the whole chapter in your devotion time this week. There's a lot here to dig into in this chapter, but these themes develop throughout the course of their dinner conversation. In verses 1-6, through Jesus heals a man with edema on the Sabbath. In verses 7 through 12, Jesus teaches them about how you shouldn't seek the highest seats of honor, but rather should sit at the lowest position of humility because it is better to be called up to the front than reduced down to a lower seat of honor. So he's teaching about humility. In verses 15 through 24, he tells this parable that I really want to start thinking about as we enter our main text today. This, this parable of the great banquet where this great great feast is made and the hosts keep sending out invitations that are met with excuses. So the host keeps reaching out to new people, ending up finally with the lowest, most humble type of people, those who live in the highways and the hedges. After rejection, after rejection, the host finally says, go get the maimed, the lame, the blind, and invite them to this feast that I'm preparing. Here there is an implication that the highly highly honored often reject the invitation of Jesus, but the lowly accept his invitation to dine with him. The themes that Jesus is driving at here are that we often in our hearts, or even outwardly, seek the highest seats of honor. But Jesus is looking for those who are gentle and lowly in heart, that are humble, that realize their brokenness before God. He sees in this Pharisee, and and many Pharisees, though not all, a man who sought out recognition. But Jesus is about to point out that discipleship is different than that. It's for the maimed. It's for the lame and it's for the blind, the dwellers of the highways and hedges. Why? Because that's where the people who aren't seeking the seat of honor are. That's where the people live that are just happy to be invited to dinner. Jesus himself said in the Sermon of the Mount, Blessed are the poor in the Spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In verse 25, once dinner is over, Jesus finds himself once again among the multitudes. And it's there that Jesus begins to talk about the cost of receiving the invitation. You see, if you think about the contextual backdrop, that 30,000 foot view that we just looked at, when you think about that backdrop which verse 25 is set, we see a theme develop here in this invitation. 
As we interrogate the text, as we think about what it means, as we dig into its message, as we begin to see these excuses and rejections of the invitation of the dinner host, the question begins to come to our mind, why would anyone reject the invitation? So while Jesus starts with a conversation with a Pharisee at dinner, I don't think it was a mistake that Luke... Dr. Luke, who wrote this gospel, he goes directly into this discourse with the multitudes in verse 25 after the dinner conversation. I believe that they're linked. The the Pharisees sought out honor. Jesus rebuking them in Matthew 23 says, they love the places of honor at feasts and the prominent seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace and being called rabbi by men. Jesus sent out the invitations but many would reject it. Why? Because of the desire for recognition of man. Friends, we can't uncouple verses 1 through 24 from the rest of Luke 14. The backdrop is so important. So with with this parable of the invitations to dinner in our mind, would you look at verse 25 with me? His large crowds went with him. And he turned and he said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Read that again. Large crowds went with him and he turned and he said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. In my opinion, this is one of the hardest verses in the whole Bible. Hate. Your own father, mother, wife, children, brothers and sisters, even your own life. What does that mean? Throughout the the Bible, we're taught to love our father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters. But here, Jesus, these are the words of Jesus. He says we need to hate them. And while I do understand when commentators try to lighten the blow here, I think Jesus used a very strong word with great intentionality here. And clearly he isn't saying that we should hate these people or treat them poorly. That's the opposite of what he taught. But he uses this word hyperbolically as a means to capture people's attention. It's supposed to raise our pulse a little bit. It's a comparative statement. It's about how as disciples of Jesus, our love for Him and our dedication to His Word must exceed even the greatest love that we have for our father, our mother, our wife, our children, our brothers, and our sisters, and yes, even our very life. Jesus brings this hard truth, and then He says, if you don't love Me far more than all these people, you cannot be My disciples. Jesus is unequivocally clear that it is going to cost something to follow Him. And it's in the backdrop of Luke 14, 16 through 20 that we get a full picture of what Jesus is saying here in this, this parable. The invitations had gone out and the initial responses had, had come in. They were responses of rejection. And these rejections compels the host to send additional invitations to the highways and hedges. Listen to the responses. Verse 16 says, A man prepared a banquet and invited many. And he sent his servant at supper time to say to those who had been invited, Come, everything is now prepared. But they all with one mind began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of land and I must go see it. I ask you to excuse me. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to prove them. 
I ask you to excuse me. Another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Friends, against this backdrop, we see more of what Jesus is saying when he says that we need to hate our father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even our own life. He's saying that sometimes the generous invitation of the host is rejected because of the relationships they have or other commitments in life. But primarily today, the relationships we have. Jesus is saying that nothing, no one, Father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, a piece of land or five yoke of oxen, nothing can come before our commitment to Jesus if we're going to be his disciples. Are we his disciples today? He's being honest that sometimes it's going to cost us these things. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my, be my disciple. This is meant to be hard language. Surely we shouldn't literally hate these people, but it should feel like hate when it's compared to the excellency of knowing Christ Jesus. Paul says it this way in Philippians 3, verse 8. He said, I count everything as loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have forfeited the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I might gain Christ. This is what Jesus is talking about, friends. This is the kind of heart that he's looking for. And I have to ask today, does that speak of the posture of our hearts today? Does Jesus come before anything and anyone else? This is how Jesus describes discipleship. He's asking for everything here in this text. He's asking us to be willing to pay any price when it comes to following him. When, he, when we think about the beginning of Luke 14, he's telling these religious leaders that they should sit in the lower seat rather than the highest. He says it's better to be called up to the higher seat than to be asked to move to one of lower honor. Jesus here is giving a call to the Pharisee at dinners to be thought of as small as those around at, it's thought of as small by those around us. He's, he's saying this to the Pharisee and to us. He's saying the same thing. Are we willing to be thought of as small for our relationship with Jesus, for our will to follow Him, for our commitment to telling the truth when blasphemy like that happens in France? Then as Jesus addresses the multitude here, when we consider this concept, this context, it's almost as if he asks, are you willing to be thought of as small by father, mother, wife, children, brothers and sisters to follow me? Are you willing to be thought of as small by those people to follow me? And I ask myself the same today. You see, this chapter all connects He's asking, would you give it all up for me? When Jesus' disciples were called, it says that they left everything immediately and they followed him. And to reinforce this connective tissue between the first half of Luke 14, the second, Jesus continues to talk about this cost of discipleship in verse 27 where he says, whoever does not bear his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. The cross speaks of sacrifice. It speaks of walking the same path that our Savior walked. It speaks of being cut off from men and walking a path alone if necessary. A path of suffering. But also, and this is important, a path of rejection. Jesus was rejected by the very people that should have recognized who he is. And he's calling us to be willing to relate to him in his rejection by men. 
He's calling us to be willing to pay the cost. He's, willing, he's calling us to resolve that we will not be the ones that make excuses, that, that just won't accept the dinner invitation. He's calling us to realize that we aren't people of status except by the work of Christ Jesus. We are the lame, the poor, the maimed, and the blind before God. And we all have received this gracious invitation and nothing or no one should ever hold us back from receiving that invitation. Who is it that holds you back today? This is a call to pay any cost. And any rejection that comes our way, this is a call to be fully committed to following Him, whatever that costs us, whoever that costs us. And Jesus is being clear in these verses that we should expect that it will cost us. But friends, i got news for you. There's hope today. This is a hard message, but I've got some hope for you today. Are you ready for that? It's coming. Jesus says this in verse 28. For who among you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost to see whether he has resources to complete it? Otherwise, perhaps after he's laid the foundation, he's not able to complete it. And all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to complete it. Right now, my house is a construction zone. And um, we've recently just poured a foundation at our house for a little addition that we're doing. Give ourselves some extra space. We have a great contractor that we work with, and um, before we began this project, we sat down with him and mapped out what it would look like to finish the project, what, the, what subcontractors we'd need. We added up the anticipated costs. We talked about the budget. And then we determined to pour the foundation. And I know I'm not alone in this. We all have projects that we need to do in our house. And I think most people would sit down and count the costs when it comes to starting a home project. But I think Jesus is asking us today, we may count the costs when it comes to projects in our house, but have we counted the cost of being a disciple of Jesus? Have we counted the cost of being disciples of Jesus? The, the, the first step in the project at my house is we had a team out and their job was to dig a big hole. And I was looking out over my property a couple weeks ago, taking some pictures. I'm trying to sort of account the steps in the process that this big job is, is taking, right? And I was looking over it a couple weeks ago and um, was looking at the big hole in the ground probably about the same deepest depth as here. And I remember thinking, I'm pretty thankful that that concrete guy is going to be here in a couple of days to fill in the hole and begin to build something. But after that, I was thinking that in our discipleship, how many of us spiritually dig the big hole in the ground and then we realize, I ran out of money. So the project just becomes that. How many of us spiritually just dig the big hole in the ground and that's what it ends up being? Jesus is honest because he he wants disciples that are ready to go all in, that are fully committed to, to him. He wants those of us who are all in. He wants to build something great in our lives. He doesn't want to leave it a big hole in the ground. That's why he wants us to count the cost. He wants to finish the good work that he started with us. And that's why he's saying there are sacrifices to make to move forward in our discipleship. Salvation, let me be clear, salvation is a gift, but committed discipleship is costly. Jesus is so clear about that. He gives another illustration in verse 31. He says, What king going to war wage to wage war against another king does not sit down and take counsel whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Otherwise, while the other is yet at a distance, he sends a delegation and requests conditions of peace. So likewise, any of you who does not forsake all that he has cannot 
be my disciple? Have we counted the cost of following Jesus? With this example, we see the theme of war. And what is more costly than war? What is more costly than the war you can't win? Here the implication is that we need conditions of peace with our great King Jesus. In the good news of the Gospel, we hear that we're all wretched sinners, proud in heart. We find that we cannot meet the 20,000 with our 10,000. We need conditions of peace which came on the cross of Calvary. Amen. And every person must respond in faith and humility to the conditions of peace offered by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Matthew Henry, great Bible commentator, explains it this way. He says, Our Savior explains this taking of our cross by two similitudes. The former showing that we must consider the expenses of our religion. The latter that we must consider the perils of it. Sit down and count the cost. Consider it will cost the mortifying of sin. Even the most beloved lust, the proudest and most daring sinner cannot stand against God for who knows the power of His anger. It is our, it is our interest to seek peace with Him and we need not send to ask for conditions of peace. They are offered to us and are highly to our advantage. That's the cross of Calvary, friends. We're offered conditions of peace in Christ Jesus. The condition of peace is placing your faith in Him. You are offered salvation and peace in Him. This is the gift of Christ Jesus for you. But like any gift, it must be received. Have you received the message of salvation today? If you've not today and you're here, you'll have an opportunity to do that for the first time today. You can know Jesus today. Salvation is a gift, but discipleship will cost you something. Following Him and growing close to Him will cost you something. Becoming fruitful in our faith will cost us something. We're saved, Paul in Ephesians 2 says, so that we can walk in discipleship. We're saved unto good works. This is our calling as believers in Jesus. My question today is, are we grasping on to that calling? Are we willing to face anything required to grow in our discipleship? Are we willing to give people up when it comes to our discipleship? Are we willing to give things up when it comes to our discipleship? Giving this teaching in Luke 14 is a man, Jesus, who is willing to do what it takes to be our friend. And he says there's a cost. He says it's going to be difficult sometimes. There's going to be tough decisions to make. He says sometimes people will walk away from you because of your dedication to growing deeper in faith. Sometimes there are things that you're going to have to lay at the altar to draw closer to Jesus. But friends, he is far greater than anything or anyone that we give up to follow him. I've seen it. He's our reward. And there is no greater reward in this earth or for eternity than having a relationship with him. No cost is too great. Jesus is our all in all. And Jesus isn't doing something. He's not asking us to do something that he didn't do. Jesus was wholly committed to the work of the Father. He says, my food is to do the will of Him who sent me and to finish His work. And because of the work that God the Father had given Him to do, Jesus was thought crazy by some people that were close to Him. He was thought crazy by His family. Mark 3, 20-21 says, They entered the house and a crowd came together again so that they could not even eat bread. And when his family heard of it, they went to seize him, for they said, he is beside himself. His family thought he was crazy because he was doing the will of God. 
If you continue reading about his ministry, that didn't cause him to quake and to back down. If anything, he doubles down on that commitment to doing the will of the Father. If anything, he ramps up his boldness. This is the example of Jesus. He's not asking us to do something that he wasn't willing to do. Who is it in your life that your, their opinion of you matters more than God's opinion of you? I'm here to tell you that I've been in a place where somebody's opinion mattered more than God's. And God used this text to chisel away at those parts of my heart. And in some ways, he's still chiseling away. Got any texts like that in your life? (laughs) But here's what I found. I've paid some costs. But Jesus is worth the cost of following him. There's no greater love than his. There's no greater comforter in the storms of life than him. There is no one else who lends an ear like he does. Listen, he's perfect. He always says the right thing. He always listens. He never fails. And I don't know about you, but I need somebody like that in my life. I've encountered a lot of people in my life, and I'm sure many of you have too, that run away when things get tough. Through it all, Jesus has never done that. I've experienced the cost of following him, but I much more than that, have experienced the joy of knowing Him. Some people that run away, it's simply because we follow Jesus or stand on some aspect of His Word. But I'm here to tell you that Jesus is better. He's better than anything or anyone that we give up in order to draw closer to Him. Jesus says in verse 26 that we're to hate even our own life. And he, being the perfect example, didn't hold on to his own life. His obedience to the will of the Father and faithfulness in declaring the truth of his word put him on a cross. And there he died for the sins of mankind, yours and mine. Amen. So that we can be saved. He loved the Father and us so much that it's so much more than his own life. And I don't know about you, but I need a friend like that. He was obedient to his father. He loved his father so much that he followed his will, even when it meant going to the cross. Jesus isn't just preaching total commitment to walking after the will of God. He lived it, and he sets the example for us. His family thought he was crazy because of it. But if you're in that situation today, Here's where the hope kicks in. You ready? Something happens. Jesus had some people in his life like, this dude is off his rocker. But then, after three years of ministry, they think he's crazy. He dies. They probably thought he was way more crazy after that. But then three days later, he raises to life again. Paul says he presented himself to them for 40 days. He was alive again on the earth before his ascension for 40 days. See, Jesus does something miraculous here that changed some things in his family life. See, his family members that wrote him off as crazy, after he rose again, his little brother James writes a letter that would be included in the biblical text, and he starts it out by saying, James, a servant of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. His little brother Jude, probably there, saying, you're nuts, dude, writes a letter that is included in the biblical text, and he starts it out by saying, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Listen, when God does something miraculous in your life, It can change skeptics into believers. It can change brothers who are willing to commit their rabbi, teacher, brother into a mental institution, into worshipers and people that call themselves servants of the one I call crazy. 
We need to be willing to pay the cost. But as we do, we keep praying for the people that call us crazy. And we're going to trust that God's going to change some skeptics into believers. So share your testimony. When God does something miraculous, tell it to people, even the ones that call you nuts. We need to be willing to bear the label of crazy. Jesus was. And when we were rejected, we pray for them. Because that's what he did. The reward is far greater than any rejection we face. Knowing Jesus is far better. So we say, though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back. No turning back. I said earlier that there's hope in the message. The first piece of hope is that he changes skeptics into believers. The second is this. I want to show you one other thing as we close. I want to turn to Matthew chapter 19. If you'd open there, say amen so I know you're there with me. I'm going to go ahead and ask the band to come up and the prayer team you can hold off for now. We'll be up in a minute. In the verses leading up to the three that we're going to look at today, a rich man approaches Jesus asking what... Must I do to have eternal life? Jesus responds that the man should keep the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. But the man responds that he'd done all these things from his youth. But Jesus perceived something in his heart. He perceived that this man had something he was holding on to above God in his heart, and the man knows it. He says, I lack something still. What is it, Jesus? And Jesus says, sell all you have and give to the poor and follow me. Verse 22, we see that the man's response was when he heard this, he went away sorrowful for he had many possessions. These three verses come in response to a question that Peter had about this encounter. Peter says in verse 27, he says, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then shall we have? Jesus' answer to the question in verse 28 is what I think we need to see this morning. We've talked about the cost of discipleship, but there's great blessing in discipleship. Jesus says, What then shall we have? And this is Jesus' answer. Verse 28, Matthew 19 says, Truly I say to you that in the regeneration when the Son of Man sits on His glorious throne, you who have followed Me will also sit on the twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So He's talking there to the disciples, right? And then what does He say in verse 29? And who? Everyone. Everyone. Who's that? That's us. Everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my name's sake shall receive a hundred times as much and inherit eternal life, but many who are first will be last. Listen, in this life there will be loss for the sake of our discipleship. Jesus is clear that discipleship requires a cross to follow him. And we need to be willing to bear that cross. But friends, the hope is that when we bear the cross, we will receive the reward in eternity 100-fold. The reward of knowing Jesus here and now, but the reward of receiving back in eternity 100-fold for everything we give up. Listen, I want this to encourage you today. I want this to raise up boldness in your hearts today because I know I've experienced it. Rejection for our faith isn't fun. Sometimes it feels painful to receive that rejection. But when you leave here today, I want you to know that it's worth it. 
It's so worth it. Bearing the cross is worth it because the rewards are indescribable. Knowing Him is indescribable. And when that day comes, when we see Him face to face, it'll all be worth it. It'll all be worth it. When He says, well done. Would you bow your heads? Close your eyes.